Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. This is episode 303, and we're recording it today to talk about astrological consultations and how you can get the most out of one. Uh, so joining me today is astrologer Lisa Scheim. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Chris. Uh, and this is, we're recording on Tuesday, May 11th, 2021, starting at uh, exactly 3.29 p.m. in Denver, Colorado. So let's go ahead and jump into this. So this was actually an episode idea that was sent in, a question that was sent in by a listener of the podcast. Um, so I want to give a shout out to them and also to um, just read the question that they sent in in order to give the context for this discussion. All right, so this question was sent in on Instagram by uh, an astrologer named Kaylee Ray at underscore kr underscore craft on Instagram. And she said, um, hey, Chris, I've got a podcast episode suggestion. I think people would love to hear how to be a good client in a natal chart consultation, how to prepare, what questions to ask, how to assist the astrologer. I feel like you've discussed how to perform consultations, but I'm not sure if I received if receiving a consultation has been covered. Uh, so thanks to Kaylee Ray for that question. Uh, Kaylee makes custom collage art for people based on their sun, moon, and rising or their entire, entire natal chart. So you should definitely check out her Instagram, and we're going to discuss that topic. So um, you liked this idea, and you thought this would be a good topic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was a really great question. You know, both sort of how to go into consultations as a client um, and kind of some specifics that you might not know about if you haven't gotten consultations before or if you're not an astrologer. Because I think um, it's easy to go into it if you don't have a lot of background um, in astrology or getting consultations and just thinking it's just this one thing. You go get a birth chart reading and then you're done. Mm -hmm. um, but it's actually more complex than that, especially in terms of like how you can actually get the most out of it rather than just kind of going in blind. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So it'll be something where this this episode and this discussion is mainly for clients because there's different ways where you can get more or you can do things that will actually undermine yourself so that you'll get less from an astrological consultation than you might otherwise. So this episode and discussion is primarily about clients getting the most that you can get from a consultation. But also, I wanted to talk about it and give some insight into astrologers and consulting astrologers and things that they can do in order to improve their astrological practice and in order to clarify what they offer so that they're attracting the type of clients that they and connecting with the type of clients that they're maybe best suited for or that are going to enjoy the consultation the most with them. Mm -hmm, definitely. All right. Um, any other preliminary stuff? Um, no, I think we could just jump into it. Okay. All right. So, um, choosing an astrologer. So, is that the starting point is for a client choose how to choose an astrologer? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because not all astrologers are going to be able to offer all of the same things. And so there's going to be a lot of differences to choose from, not just in terms of like personality or, you know, just who seems like they might mesh well with you um personally but also the specifics of what they can offer or do offer. So different topic specialties. So for instance, if you want to focus more on like um, what's going on with your career um, or relationships or medical or financial astrology, um, those are all different specialties that not every astrologer will be sort of equally well-versed in, in giving a consultation around. Right. Yeah. So there's different um astrologers and astrologers come in all shapes and sizes and um there's different things as a client that you need to know that not all astrologers do and not mm -hmm. all astrologers either practice the same thing or use the same approach there's also different branches within each of the approaches or different applications of astrology that people specialize in mm -hmm. and so understanding that there are differences and that you need to actually research the subject ahead of time so that you end up with an astrologer that does the type of thing that you're looking for is actually pretty important. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I don't know if everyone really understands for when they first come into the field, you know, just as an enthusiast, how many different approaches there are. So for instance, like Hellenistic or medieval or modern or psychological, those are all going to be not just different takes on your chart, but will really be discussing different information in many ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so 
for some clients, it's like they may not know that there are different approaches and it may not matter to them, mm. but there's some clients where they may have an expectation that an astrologer should talk about these sort of things or should do these sort of things. And some of those things that an astrologer is going to focus on could be tradition specific. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, there's a difference sometimes between modern astrology tends to be more psychological in orientation, whereas traditional astrology sometimes tends to be more predictive and concrete in its orientation. Mm -hmm. So that's good to be aware of because sometimes if you're, you know, going into a consultation looking for a predictive orientation, but you're seeing a psychological astrologer, then there might be a disconnect there. Mm -hmm. Or vice versa, if you're looking for more of a psychological discussion about some stuff that you're going through at the time and you go see some hardcore predictive medieval astrologer, then that's also not exactly going to line up with what you're looking for, what your expectations are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I find sometimes that people can be a little bit surprised. I mean, one of the things that is good um, in this era is that there are so many things like podcasts and YouTube videos and blogs. And so you can kind of get a sense of what an, a specific astrologer's orientation might be. Um, you know, just by checking out things that they've done in the past and just listening to them and seeing what kind of things they talk about. Yeah. So I guess that's the first thing first, and that's going to be an overarching thing for this entire episode is that you, to get the most out of a consultation, you actually need to do some research and know what you're getting into and what you're looking for, and also research the astrologers that you're considering seeing. So part of that obviously involves something as simple as just reading their website thoroughly, mm. making sure you've checked out all of their different consultation pages, all of their bio or their about me page. Um, maybe read some blog posts or you know Twitter, or Instagram, or YouTube videos or whatever, wherever they produce content and try to get a sense for what their approach is and how they describe themselves and what kind of techniques they're using. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah, so that's important to go in. And you can also get a sense of who people are personally or their kind of personal style as well, which I think the astrological style is probably a bit more important going into it in terms of just the content of what you're going to get. But you know, the personal style can be important too. So you can kind of get a sense, especially with those kind of social media things you were mentioning or videos um, of you know just what they're like as a person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes that's funny. If like so I've heard, I've had, I've seen people that like um, get a consultation and with somebody whose public persona is very like extravagant mm. and stuff, and then they're surprised that that also carries forward somewhat into their consultations. Right. And I always kind of wonder, like, what did you expect? Like, mm. That's what their public pre pre presentation presentation was yeah. like as well. Yeah, definitely. I'm always surprised when people, when clients reference my my Twitter posts in my in consultation. Mm. I'm like, all oh, right, you do read this, <laughs> right? Um, all right. So, what tradition does the person like identify with, if any at all, or what traditions? What topic special specialities? Like, there's some astrologers that really specialize in relationships um, or synastry readings, which is like comparing two people's charts. There's some astrologers that specialize in like career analysis. There's some astrologers that specialize in like a bunch of different topics. Like mm -hmm. fertility astrology is like a, a technique or an approach that some people use. Mm -hmm. So knowing that there's different things that an astrologer might, even if they don't ex don't specialize in it, like they've written a book about it, which some astrologers will have done, but even if it's just something that they excel at or they tend to focus more attention on mm -hmm. compared to other astrologers, that's good to know. Yeah, definitely, because not everyone will really have equally um, as much to say about any given topic. And so usually any given astrologer will have something to say about the topic you're interested in, but you really want to go to one who has like a lot to say about it if you have a particular topic in mind. Yeah, so that's important. Um, there's also different branches of astrology within each of the traditions. So there's natal astrology, which is reading birth charts, which is what most consultations are focused on, but there's also Electional astrology, which is when you're choosing auspicious dates in the future to launch new ventures and undertakings using the principles of astrology. And that's not necessarily something that every astrologer specializes in. Mm. There's also horary astrology, which is typically when the astrologer casts a chart for a single specific question, typically that has like a yes or no answer and tries to 
answer the question only based on that one chart. Mm -hmm. And that's a somewhat specialized thing that not all astrologers do and is good for certain types of questions and not as good for other types of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that's actually an important piece because um, you might at different times as a client want a natal consultation versus, say, a horary question. You have to actually be careful about like what you're actually looking for out of it. Mm -hmm. So do you want a discussion of like your birth chart as a whole and a particular area of your chart or timing around it? Or do you want like a really pretty clear, like, is this going to happen or not? Like what you can't always get from natal, like sometimes it's clearer than others. Mm -hmm. um, but so you kind of have to be careful about what you're looking for. And similarly with electional, that's usually not something that's going to be done on the fly during a face-to-face -face consultation. Like maybe someone could, but it's the astrologer themselves have to have to look at the charts like over and over, like without necessarily like interacting. And so that's not usually what you're going to do during a consultation either. Yeah. Like if you go into a natal consultation and then suddenly ask for an electional thing that may or may not fly or may not work for the astrologer and that may not be how they're set up to do things. Mm -hmm, exactly. All right, so that's an important thing. Um, there's also different techniques that different astrologers specialize in or have strong preferences about. Mm. So, for example, um, knowing what zodiac an astrologer uses, whether they use like the tropical zodiac or the sidereal zodiac. Um, sometimes different house systems. Does the astrologer use uh, quadrant house systems like Placidus or Porphyry, or do they use equal houses, or do they use Holstein houses, or what have you? Mm -hmm. This is something that mainly comes up if the client already has a strong preference for one or the other, or you know, sometimes doesn't know. It may not matter to them, mm. but. If the client is somebody who's like a beginner or intermediate astrologer, even an advanced astrologer, they may already have a preference about how they like to read their chart and how they would like another astrologer to read it. And that kind of segues into one of our next topics, I think, mm -hmm. which is um, your expectations and and you know how much you should try to Finding a, find an astrologer that matches the approach that you want to take technically versus mm -hmm. how much you should leave that up to the astrologer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that can be different based on like whether you want a different take on your chart um, because you know that can be desirable at times versus if you want to stick with kind of the strain that you're already familiar with and you want to you know keep hearing about it from that vantage point. Right. Um, so the important point there is that. Uh, the astrologer already has preferences. And one really important thing to do is going into a consultation to get the most of it. And also, because the the subtitle of this episode was like how to be a good client for an astrology consultation mm -hmm. and not do stuff that's either going to be that's going to undermine the consultation or make you get less out of it or cause basically problems in the con consultation in different ways. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you can do to be really annoying is to ask the astrologer to use an approach or a system that is different from what they would normally do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you go and get a consultation with a tropical astrologer and you ask them to use the sidereal zodiac, that's not really going to work. Mm -hmm. Or if you go to the astrologer and um, they use, uh, let's say, Holstein houses, but you ask them to use Placidus or quadrant houses, or vice versa. If you go to an astrologer that normally uses Placidus and you ask them to use whole sign, mm. that automatically creates a sort of conflict where the astrologer probably won't go along with that. And they'll probably be like, no, that's not how mm -hmm. this works. I, I use the system that I use because I think that's what works best. Mm -hmm. And if you're coming to me, then that's the approach we're going to use. There might like occasionally be an astrologer that might do that um, under certain contexts, but not not typically. So mm. you need to know that going into a consultation that you need to be prepared to use whatever system that astrologer uses. And therefore, if you have strong preferences, you should research that ahead of time to see if the astrologer uses the approach that you prefer. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then you need to, instead of trying to change the astrologer's preferences, you need to find an astrologer that does match what you're looking for. Yeah, definitely. Because it's not just a matter of like um, politeness or something like you might think, but it's actually how you're going to get the best out of a consultation because 
the astrologer presumably is going to excel at whatever they've been practicing for a long time, right? Um, and so asking them to sort of switch that up on the fly, it's it's not just like even if someone was willing to do that, like it's not really going to play to their strengths nearly as much, and therefore you're not going to get the best out of it, and you're also not going to get a sense of like what they do best and what they could speak to best uh, about your chart. Yeah, and that doesn't just that doesn't just extend to preferences in terms of when there's alternatives between things, but it also extends to just other techniques that the astrologer may or may not use. Mm -hmm. So if you go into the consultation, you ask the astrologer to use you know, certain asteroids or tell you what certain asteroids mean and mm -hmm. they don't use asteroids, right. then they're not going to have anything to tell you. Mm -hmm. Or even if it's something where the astrologer like kind of has like a little vague amount of knowledge about that, if it's not something they specialize in and mm -hmm. you try to slide in something that they're not super strong on, mm. it's not going to produce as good of a delineation or interpretation as you might hope. Exactly. Because they're going to just try to come up with something on the fly that's sort of like what you're asking about, but it's not going to be like their strengths. Right. Um, so it's like if you're looking for an asteroid reading, then find an astrologer that says that they specialize in asteroids. If you're looking for the Arabic parts or the lots, find somebody that specializes in that, mm. and so on and so forth when it comes to specific techniques instead of trying to get somebody that doesn't really specialize in something to do something that they're either uncomfortable with or are weak on or not particularly proficient at. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that's kind of related to another subpoint um, that I know we were going to talk about, which is like sometimes it can be better to lead with the life topics that you're experiencing or are wondering about <clears throat> versus like specific placements that you think are related to that in your chart. Because sometimes when people lead with the placements, um, they can have preconceptions about like where a certain um, issue is coming from in their chart. Mm -hmm. But if you just talk about this is what's happening in my life and I'm trying to figure out why that is based on my chart, that usually goes a lot better. I yeah. find. I mean, it's really tricky because there's a certain level where it's okay to have some specific questions about certain placements in your chart if mm -hmm. they are sort of generic enough that your astrologer should be able to handle it or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, what does the moon in my first house mean or something sure. like that? Um, assuming whatever house system they use, the moon is in the first house, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but so there's a certain level where that's okay, and you shouldn't feel afraid to ask questions about specific placements. But you're right that it does otherwise tend to go better if you come with a question about an area of the life or a desire to focus on an area of life or a topic that is topical and not astrological, and then let the astrologer apply whatever techniques they would apply in order to analyze that topic. And that may mm -hmm. or may not be the same techniques that you're expecting them to use. Yeah. And that's, you know, positive and negative, but it's mainly positive because it may expose you to techniques and approaches that you weren't familiar with prior to that consultation. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that's a huge part of getting an astrological consultation is learning things that are new that you don't already know and being exposed to new techniques and technical approaches and interpretive principles. That you may not have learned before, even if you're like, let's say, an intermediate or even advanced student of astrology. Mm -hmm, definitely. And so the astrologer may otherwise feel the need to then like follow up what the, your line of thinking, um, and you may not actually get their full take if you lead with the placements. Yeah. So, um, are we talking about what section are we on? Um, let the astrologer use the approach they use. Okay. Yeah. What are the other subtopics in that? Yeah, that was that was pretty much it. I mean, and you'll find that some astrologers will be more flexible about that in, than others, or may even just be exposed to multiple different approaches mm -hmm. than like someone else. And so, like for instance, um, you know, I use whole sign houses. I use traditional rulerships. Uh, I use sort of a blend of Hellenistic and modern, just as an example. And but I will kind of click on like some of the major asteroids as like a different set and click off when I'm like preparing. And if I notice one that's really prominent, maybe I'll talk about it. So there are things like that. I mean, there are astrologers that are like have, it's not completely cut and dry, you know, in terms of, so you can ask, it's just not good to like assume that you'll dwell there. Yeah. Well, it, it goes back to the traditions thing because the biggest thing that is a mistake, I think, that most clients can do when they're beginner or 
almost intermediate students of astrology is go into a consultation with the expectation that every astrologer should be able to talk about certain mm. techniques or should put it just as much emphasis on certain placements as other astrologers do or as whatever tradition you've been studying. Mm -hmm. And that really comes down to the issue of um, somebody was asking recently on YouTube about like the void of course moon and mm. hearing a really bad thing where that was really being emphasized as a difficult placement. And part of my response was that, you know, I've been doing this whole series on Void of Course Moon episodes over the past six months. But part of it was just that the Void of Course Moon is is seriously overhyped in modern astrology mm -hmm. in like late 20th and early 21st century astrology. Mm. And there's some traditions that do that where they'll pick out like one thing and then place undue emphasis on that one thing. Mm -hmm, right? Like when I was early in my <laughs> studies of astrology, it was um yods. Mm. I'm super into yods, and right. I thought that was like a super important thing. And now I, I don't think that's like the most important thing in astrology. Or mm. some astrologers put all the emphasis, or some schools of astrology put all the emphasis on the nodes and mm. like the nodes of the moon are the most important thing. Right. Or the lot of fortune or like what mm. have you. And sometimes as a result of that, and having like studied certain schools or picked up certain books that focus on certain schools first, the client will come into the consultation with these expectations that the astrologer is going to focus on this one thing as like the most important thing and is going to give similar emphasis to it as every other astrologer they've read has up to that point, and mm -hmm. that may not be the case. Yeah, definitely. I find that happens a lot with the nodes because evolutionary astrology focuses a lot more on the nodes, and um, it's just easily accessible online. And so a lot of people come into consultations thinking that like all astrologers will speak to that or like put a lot of you know attention and time towards that in the consultation. And I don't personally, so that is something that comes up a lot. Yeah, or somebody was asking me about like the lead planet in like the locomotive mm -hmm. um, yeah. pattern in their chart and that being the most important planet. And she was confused because she didn't understand then how that meshed with the ruler of the ascendant, which some modern astrologers call the ruler of the chart, mm. and was creating a conflict. And I'm like, well, I don't really use the locomotive or the lead planet concept, so that's mm -hmm. not really an issue for me. Right. So that's a disconnect I think clients, though, especially very early in their studies of astrology, will commonly run into is whatever astrology you approach may not have the same approach as you mm. unless you're like literally getting a consultation with the person that authored the book that you read. Like if you're getting right. a consultation with Stephen Forrest, he's going to focus on the nodes. Mm -hmm. Or if you're getting a consultation with, you know, somebody that wrote a book on Void of Course Moons, then yeah, they're going to like put a lot of emphasis on that. Mm. But somebody that is not that specific astrologer uh, might not. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it's it's not quite the perfect analogy, but it's kind of like um, in law, like different law lawyers will specialize in different things. And you, I think there's like an idea that you can just go to any lawyer um, and be like, be my lawyer for like whatever, but that's not actually how it works. There's like different ones for different things. Yeah, I had to learn that last fall for like copyright. There's copyright lawyers mm -hmm. that specialize in copyright law and because those are like whole areas that have their own like literature and their own <clears throat> procedures and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So is there anything else in that subtopic? Mm, no, I don't really think so. Okay. Yeah. Um, so where do we go next? Let's, Let's back jump. up to yeah. signing to scheduling. Yeah, signing up and scheduling. Okay. <clears throat> so um, there will be different offerings that different astrologers have. And so like you were mentioning, <clears throat> excuse me, um, go ahead. Okay. Um, so what we have in the outline, <laughs> what we have in the outline is um, different offerings. One consultation can't cover everything. So you need to pay attention to the consultations section of an astrologer's website because usually they'll list different types of consultations. Not all astrologers do this. Some people would just have a blanket consultation and mm. a blanket fee, but there's some astrologers that will offer different types of consultations for different fees that are focused on different things. So for example, on my website when I was still doing consultations a few years ago before this podcast took over and, and ruined my life, uh, I offered natal chart consultations and electional astrology consultations and um, relationship analysis consultations and birth time rectification consultations. Mm. 
because each of those were kind of like different things. And some of those were conducted verbally, either over you know Skype or in person. And some of those were just written reports, or some of those were just emails and things I would prepare and send to you as a written thing. And they all involved also different levels of time expenditure on my part. So there were different like fees for each of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So you need to know what you're signing up for and a sign up for the most appropriate thing. Um, and it's important to know that you can't cover everything in one consultation. And so you do need to sign up for like one specific thing and not assume that you're going to be able to cover like all life topics in like a single reading. Um, yeah. So managing expectations about how much can be covered is a whole separate topic in and of itself. But mm. typically most, again, let's just go back to natal astrology consultations because that's the vast majority of what most astrologers do. And that's the vast majority of what most clients are looking for is a birth chart interpretation. Mm -hmm. Those are typically only 75 minutes long, give or take. Some mm -hmm. are going to be an hour long. Some are going to be an hour and a half long. 75 minutes is pretty standard and is a good average. Mm. There's only so much that can be said between two people during the 75 minutes, mm -hmm. and your life is a pretty long and detailed topic. You're not going to be able to cover everything in that 75 minutes. So you need to manage your expectations about how much you can cover right from the start going into it. Mm -hmm, definitely. And that kind of connects to knowing what you want to get out of the consultation. So you need to kind of state clearly up front like what you would like to talk about. Yeah. So in your opening email, presumably when the consultation is being scheduled and negotiated, you need to be clear about saying what you want to focus on, partially to get your own expectations out there and also for the astrologer to be able to respond and say, uh, that is something I can help you with, or no, that's not something that I can help you with. And so that mm -hmm. there's an agreement ahead of time to some extent about what you're going to cover going into it. Mm -hmm. So that's a little tricky because you need to be careful and you need to strike a balance between um, not saying too much. Like, mm -hmm. do not, you know, major mistake that some clients make. Uh, do not write like a 20 page essay about your life in your opening, mm -hmm. just like email to the astrologer. <laughs> right. In your opening email to the astrologer because. Um, they're not going to read all of that, and and that's just too much information to start out with. Mm -hmm, definitely, yeah. But you also, on the flip side, need need to say kind of what you want to focus on, like you mentioned, to make sure that you're on the same page about whether the astrology astrologer can fulfill that, and um, also to focus the consultation a little bit more. I mean, some astrologers will just have a blanket like this is a birth chart reading, and may not have a section to say what you would like to discuss beyond that. Right. Um, but some will. Um, and I know I that mean, I think there's some negotiation in most consultations ahead of time. Yeah, some negotiation for sure. Um, but you know, just some are more open ended than others. Like for instance, I just I don't have like birth chart reading. I have what would you like to talk about? What would you like to most focus on? Um, and then people have to write, you know, a few paragraphs. And I know that a number of people do have that. Yeah. And to balance out the other thing about don't write a 10 page essay, don't do the other extreme and not state if it's open to state in your initial email what you want to focus on and what you're looking for, mm -hmm. just try to keep it concise to like a few short paragraphs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you do that, then you'll be able to state your expectations clearly so the astrologer can, if they can do that, can know what techniques to apply in preparing because some astrologers spend time preparing for the consultation ahead of time. And that's one mm -hmm. of the reasons why it's important for some astrologers to know ahead of time what you want to focus on. Because for example, for me, I would always spend at least an hour of prep for each consultation, and I would apply certain techniques and write out certain notes and apply certain timing techniques, and I would write notes next to different periods mm -hmm. and send that to the client as like a PDF ahead of time so that they are looking at the same thing that I am and we can go over it together. Um, so some astrologers, if they do any prep, that's actually a really important piece to give them some context for what you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they may focus on some completely different area of your life that has no 
relation to what you actually want to look into or talk about in that consultation. Mm -hmm, definitely. And they may or may not be able to kind of pull it up on the fly if you sort of just ask within the consultation, but it probably won't be as good if it's something that they ordinarily have to put prep time into. Right. Yeah. I mean, some astrologers can just pull it up on the fly, and mm -hmm. to a certain extent, each astrologer has to get used to being able to do that and will. And there's some astrologers I know, I think Rick Levine says he doesn't do any prep, mm -hmm. um, but he's been doing consultations for for decades, 40 years yeah. at this point. And so, you know, he he knows how. And there's some astrologers that have also had more training in that. So, for example, Nick Dagan Best, who's been on the podcast many times, used to work for one of those companies where it was like a phone line and, mm -hmm. they, and clients would call up and they were being charged by the minute, so they would just like go, mm -hmm. and he would have to cast the chart immediately once they got on the call, and immediately start applying whatever techniques are necessary to answer their question. Mm -hmm. So that's different and requires a little bit different training, and it's something that all astrologers get used to. But there might be some that have more or less proficiency with working on the fly versus some who might prepare to have more prep time, and especially newer astrologers or younger astrologers or ones that are still. Earlier in their career, may take more prep time mm. um, ahead of time than astrologers have been around longer. Yeah, or depending on what people are asking, it just might require it, or you might get a better response if they do have prep time. Like asking about like something five years from now, like they may not have that off the top of their head, you know, during the consult. Yeah, it takes like a few minutes to like do the secondary progressions or to calculate the perfections or the transits and everything else, mm -hmm. and it's a matter of if. Your astrol you want your astrologer to have that ready to go ahead of time, or if you, you know, want to waste several five minutes of that seventy five minutes that you have having them try to like fumble to like calculate it on the fly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And something about asking or sort of like explaining well enough to ahead of time what you'd like to focus on, which is a good few paragraphs, is like you could say, for instance, the talk topic of relationships. You could just say relationships, but it's probably going to be a little bit better if you say my marriage is on the rocks and I'm trying to decide what to do or you know something a little more specific like that mm -hmm. um, or I haven't been in a relationship since 7 years ago and I'm wondering if I'm going to find another one or you know a little bit more background which still doesn't need to take very many words but just so the astrologer kind of knows a little bit more how to gear it or what they're looking for yeah so that um I think that takes us into one of the things though in terms of um one of the rules or one of the good pieces of advice, like you don't have to follow it, but don't try to test the astrologer. Mm -hmm. um, giving the astrologer information provides them with context about the chart that is going to allow them to do a better and more accurate job of both interpreting your chart and making it relevant to your life, as well as making any predictions that they're going to make. Mm -hmm. Because part of the process of doing astrological pr astrological predictions is is the analysis of the chart and the transits but also the more you know about the trajectory of the life up to this point the more you can then plot out like where it's going to go after the present time and in the future mm -hmm. and this came up recently with like a student in my hellenistic course where there's a discussion about bill gates and his recent announcement of like a divorce from melinda gates from his wife of like 27 years mm -hmm. And Saturn is like going through his because I've used that as a as a chart example in my course and in my I think it's in my book as well. And Saturn's in his eighth house right now. But one of the things that I said is that I thought um, the marriage probably broke up while Saturn was transiting through his seventh house mm. through Capricorn because he's Cancer rising over the past few years. Mm. And it's just they're sort of making it public now that they're going to actually go through the process of splitting up whatever assets. Are involved, and I think that was actually confirmed recently. That um, there's a report that came out mm -hmm. that she first visited a lawyer in like 2019. Right. So one of the questions that the student said was, you know, is there a way that we could have told that that Saturn transit through his seventh house would coincide with divorce, as opposed to other scenarios like the death of a spouse or mm -hmm. something like that? And part of my answer is, especially if you're just talking about looking at that one transit, part of the answer is, is no. Um, it partially and, and very largely depends on the context of the life and what the tra trajectory has been up to that point. Mm -hmm. Because usually, 
stuff doesn't often come out of nowhere, but sometimes earlier versions of that transit where Saturn was in earlier versions of that cycle would have set up a, the trajectory. So for example, I was reading a story about how in like 2013 they had like a major fight about um co-authoring a newsletter together where it was like he was the primary author and she wanted to to co-author it with him and he said no and they fought about it and she said that they almost broke up or something but then eventually there was some leeway and she started writing like a sub article and then they co-authored it the next year mm -hmm. and that would have been that time frame that it said in the article was when Saturn was transiting through Scorpio which would have been his Saturn return when Saturn was returning back to its natal position and also activating his Saturn, which is the ruler of his seventh house. Mm -hmm. And now we see, you know, seven or eight years later, we see the like um, waxing square of that now that Saturn is in Aquarius, the next fixed sign, mm -hmm. and it's them breaking up. Right. So we can kind of tell if you're looking at things like that, if we'd taken that back even further in seven years before that. There was probably some other issue that came up that tested their relationship and made them question whether it was going to continue, whether they're going to stay in it. Mm. And seven years before that, there may have been something similar. So part of astrological prediction is the astrologer sitting down with the client and going through their chronology and figuring out the life trajectory. And once you do that and you identify certain patterns and certain planets that coincide with certain types of events over and over again, mm -hmm. you can usually project that out, but it requires the context in order to be able to make an accurate prediction, or at least you'll make a more accurate prediction with context than you would without. Yeah, definitely, because there is an archetypal um, experience around certain transits or certain different timing things with regard to astrology. And so you might not be able to say nearly as specifically what it will be um, without the context. And I always like to think of it as though you're going into a doctor's office and they have like a list of your lab results, but you refuse to tell them <clears throat> like what you're actually experiencing symptom wise. It's kind of a similar thing where yeah, you're like, why don't you guess? <laughs> right, exactly. It's kind of similar. You're to a that. doctor. You went to medical school. Right, right, and it's similar. Like, right, you have a list of like values. You have a list of numbers. It's kind of similar to having a chart and transits and whatever timing you're using. You can get the shape of things without hearing from the client, but right. it's going to take you a lot longer and you're going to be less precise trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Yeah, because you're going to make them act like they're Sherlock Holmes in order mm -hmm. to like uh, track down and see like by your facial um, you know paleness or something like that, or you have. <laughs> Track, track marks on your arm that you're actually like a you've been struggling with drug addiction and you're a heroin user instead of mm -hmm. coming to them and being like you know doc, doc I'm a I'm a heroin user and I'm struggling with addiction issues mm -hmm. you know can you help me with that or something like that mm -hmm. and the same with the astrologer as if they're supposed to infer what the precise manifestations of each of the placements are when there's a range of different manifestations for each one of them mm -hmm. right exactly yeah, because if you go into a doctor, like you could get a bunch of different diagnoses that would still have some of the same lab values. So it's it's a bit similar to that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the Bill Gates transit, it's just Saturn transiting through the self, seventh house, and it's the most basic, just difficulties with relationships, let's say, mm -hmm. as like the broad archetype of that transit. And under that rubric, there could have been many different, you know, types of difficulties with relationships. But evidently mm -hmm. for them, it was. Um, you know, the dissolving of a relationship and and the end of a relationship, mm -hmm. or even like say was that I releasing with a loosing of the bond, like that's a major turning point. But whether that's a turning point towards like, you know, like a separation of a relationship versus if you've been single up to that point, it might be getting married. Like it can be a very different turning point depending on what the context is before that point. Right. Yeah. So all context is important. Um. You know, I, I understand that there's some people that might be skeptics of astrology, or even if you're not fully skeptical, you want to see what the astrologer can do. And you mm -hmm. kind of, there's a part of everyone that wants to be impressed by it. Um, so I understand that, and there's a place for that. But just understand if that's what you're trying to do, you're probably in the end going to get less out of the consultation than you might have otherwise. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, even if you give, if you give the person context, you may still be able to accomplish what you're seeking out to do because if they have better context for your life, 
any predictions that they do make are going to be much more grounded in um, the birth chart and in actually realistic potential outcomes. So they may actually mm -hmm. be able to make much more successful and much more precise and accurate predictions if they have the context of your life, which would actually serve the same purpose as a demonstration of astrology being valid and useful and having predictive capabilities of some sort versus you know the approach of just trying to get them to guess what your life and personality is like based on not telling them anything so that's actually worst case scenario that's probably the least productive thing is the just sitting stone faced with no talking to them about your life and no no um feedback or anything else because one of the most important points is that an astrological consultation is primarily supposed to be a dialogue between you, the client, and the astrologer, mm -hmm. and that back and forth and that that piece of dialogue is actually a really crucial part of the entire process. Mm -hmm, definitely, and I think that's something that's easy to not fully understand earlier on when you're getting into astrology. You sort of expect that more should be coming out of just the chart itself, um, but it really is a dialogue, and yeah. Yeah, so um, don't talk too little. Flip side of that pers that um, spectrum is don't talk too much because mm -hmm. the other major um, stumbling block and major mistake that some clients can make is you've only got 75 minutes. Um, some people will just talk and talk and talk and talk about their life mm -hmm. and not give any time or room for the astrologer to actually say anything about it astrologically like mm -hmm. this is actually a legitimate thing that sometimes happens right. is the client will talk so much about their life um experience that uh they won't sort of let the astrologer lead or the astrologer doesn't entirely have to lead but um ideally we're talking about at least like a 50-50 thing here rather than mm -hmm. Let's say worst case scenario, the client talks 90% of the time, and then the astrologer gets just like 10% or a few minutes to say anything about the chart, and then the consultation is over and the client is unhappy, mm -hmm. feeling like they didn't get much from it. But the reason for that is that they ended up spending most of the time talking and weren't mm -hmm. conscious about the fact that they were talking more than listening to an actual interpretation of their chart. Right. And that can be tricky because, you know, of course, there's some value in the client being able to just like talk to someone about what's going on. Um, but the astrologer isn't supposed to be only a counselor or a sounding board. Like, I mean, I mean if, if the client wants that, that's fine. Yeah. They just have to understand that they're using the time for that right. and, and not be disappointed mm -hmm. when because sometimes then the astrologer can be put in an awkward position of like the time is up and, right. the, and we we need to end this mm -hmm. and we can't some astrologers can't like extend it or go long or mm -hmm. even if you pay them extra they may have another client lined up after that so they have to end it at that point or an right. appointment so it's fine if you do want to do that you just have to understand that that's what you're using your time for then mm -hmm. um and it's not the astrologer's fault if um, they aren't able to get as much interpretation in as a result of that. Yeah, definitely. Because it can also put the astrologer in a little bit of an awkward position of like, well, should I interrupt um, to make sure that they hear the things that I actually can tell them? Or is this what they want from the consultation? Um, yeah. So, um, and I have occasionally had, you know, people say afterwards, like, oh, I wished I hadn't talked as much when I listened back through the recording because it was mostly me talking. So, yeah. Yeah. So just be conscious of that. Um, and, and sometimes people do that just because they're nervous and they're talking mm. to a stranger who the astrologer or the client is talking to the astrologer is a stranger right. or or maybe they have a lot on their mind and they just did need to process it with someone and that's fine. Just mm. um, think about it going into it, what you want to get. Yeah. And you know, ideally, most of the time trying to find a balance between those two is the most effective thing between not talking too much and not talking too too little. Definitely. All right. So, um, testing the astrologer, anything else? Um, no, I mean, I think the only other piece about not testing the astrologer is that like, we all come from different backgrounds. And so it's not just the, the immediate specific context of what you're coming to the astrologer for, but it's even like, what kind of background am I coming from? You know, um, 
you could have something going on with someone's ninth house and they could be doing a postdoc or they could be just struggling to go to undergrad for the first time, you know, and so you're still going to be talking about ninth house things. But um, I've had that also occasionally with job things where <clears throat> someone is living like in an area that's very um, isolated and so there aren't many jobs at all. And that's a very different context to be talking about career timing versus like someone living in a metropolitan city and like having advanced degrees and things like that. So it's kind of like, you know, the chart can be like the chart for a turtle or the chart for a person, even if it's even all the if all the charts. Hey, that's my line. <laughs> but even if all the charts are for people, we still all come from very different backgrounds and contexts growing up um, and life experience wise. Right. And so <laughs> I'm really laughing hurt. about that. <laughs> Get your own analogies. The turtle. Tur the turtle analogy is mine. The rock, maybe a rock. Um, that's not an animate object. <laughs> Obviously, that's, that's a terrible analogy. <laughs> a mouse. I'll use a mouse. Okay. Um, yeah, so, but we all, I, I have, I mean, that, and that's something you learn as an astrologer on the flip side, but that, you know, your own assumptions about like where people are coming from on average in terms of life opportunities and ex past experiences they already have on their belt and things like that um, can be very different. And that will shape like what you say about like timing for the next year or two or something like that. Yeah, like let's look at our um, diagram that shows the significations of the houses. So what are, our, what are our ninth house significations? Travel, foreign things, education, religion. So somebody may have placements in the ninth house and that manifests as, like let's say they're going through a Saturn transit and they, it, go, it manifests as education is like a major focus for them at this time. Another mm -hmm. person may have a Saturn transit and living in a foreign country is like a major focus for two or three years during that time. Mm -hmm. Another person may have that transit and they're going through like a religious um, conversion or something like that at that time. Mm -hmm. So there's different ways that the same or a similar transit or chart placement can manifest in a variety of different ways that all fall under the same archetypal rubric or, or archetype as we say. Um, but it, it really helps to know the context uh, of that in order to be able to make more specific statements about it, especially in terms of projecting that out in the future. Mm -hmm, definitely. And that is what an astrological consultation is, and, and we need to really drill down on that. An astrological consultation is a dialogue and a back and forth, a first house, seventh house exchange between two parties where um, the client says something about their life, the astrologer looks at the chart and connects that with the chart, and that helps the astrologer understand better certain chart placements. Then the astrologer says something back to the client in interpreting that, mm -hmm. that, sit, that hits the client in a certain way and may unlock certain things that they then remember or think are relevant, which they then state to the astrologer. And then the astrologer looks at the chart again, and that further clarifies something that they're seeing in the chart, which they then state to the client. And that's the process, really, ideally, that's happening that entire 75 minutes is the two of you are coming to understand your life better, the client's life better, and getting an increasingly clearer and clearer picture and understanding of it based on the back and forth and the dialogue and the exchange that's occurring within the context of the consultation. Mm -hmm. And once you understand that, um, as the client and understand that that's what's actually supposed to be happening in the consultation, then it kind of clears up a lot of things and you understand some of these pros and cons that we're mentioning of the more optimal, the most optimal way to do that and not, you know, overemphasizing or underemphasizing certain parts of that because it's, mm. it needs to be pretty even in order to work the most optimally most of the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something you only learn if you've had consultations or if you have done consultations for a while on either side as either party is like, oh, the dialogue is actually where it's at. It's not just here, let me give you information. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right. So that being said, it's still one 75 minute thing. It's just one consultation. You're not going to be able to go over everything. So you have to moderate mm -hmm. your own expectations about how much you can cover and prioritize what's important to you to cover. Maybe you do have a mm -hmm. long list of 10 different things. But it'd be best if you prioritized them from most to least important, and then just try to cover what you can in that time and understand that you may only be able to get through, let's say, five of those things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think kind of related to that, um, it's important to know that when you go and talk with an astrologer, even if you're having a birth chart reading and it's just stated as a birth chart reading generically, it's going to be one take on your chart. It's not going to be the like 
the be and end all forever. Like it's there's not a once and done um, certain single meaning of your chart or even a certain single meaning of a, a single chart placement um, because your life evolves over time, you know, and so different placements can manifest in different specific ways over time um, or even multiple ways at a single time in your life. Um, and also you... Um, <laughs> What do, you, do you have any examples of that by chance? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> not that we haven't mentioned many times before on the podcast, but there was this this younger astrologer once that I gave a reading to, and I talked about certain chart placements being relevant, and they were like, uh, no, that has absolutely no relevance in my life, and they didn't exactly call me a terrible astrologer, <laughs> but this, this young woman um, uh, said in no in certain terms that the delineation was not correct and did not fit her life in any way. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you recall, <laughs> recall me talking I, about this? I do. I do recall. Okay. Yeah. So certain things can only manifest later in life, and so they may not make immediate sense at a certain time of your life, especially earlier on. Right. But the astrologer <laughs> ultimately could still be right. They could be. They could be if you're talking to like a really good astrologer <laughs> like me. Uh, so I. Had I had looked at your chart just in passing one day uh, when we were hanging out. It wasn't a consultation like a uh, normal client astrologer thing, but more uh, looking at each other's charts as friends in passing or something like that. And I mm -hmm. said it's a certain placement that it uh, would make sense in terms of getting involved in organizations or leading an organization or something like that in an organizational capacity. Or groups of people. Doing yeah. something with groups of people. Ninth house and eleventh house stuff. And that had not been the case for you for the most part up to that point. But then later you became the president of an astrological organization for the better part of like a decade. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was right. You're uh, right. But, but in fairness, it had not happened yet. And right. It was a placement that hadn't manifested in your life yet, right. supposedly. Right. And so this is not only for you to recount the story again, but in terms of relevance to what we're talking about today. Um you know, you have to be open to things that may not have manifested yet in your particular chart. Like right. that, that that is actually a thing. So an astrologer can be talking about a placement in your chart or collection of placements, and maybe you don't relate to it. Um, and it could just be that it hasn't happened yet, because particularly in traditional astrology, um, you know, not everything, it, not everything in the chart is seen as like constantly happening. It's more like they can be turned on at different times. So that's always a possibility. On the flip side, I mean, and that's especially relevant for younger people. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. a real, real problem and, and potential pitfall with with doing consultations for younger people is a lot of the stuff that may the chart that may be indicated in the chart about their mm -hmm. life may not have manifested or may not have happened yet. Right. And sometimes people grow and change as they get older, or their life goes in directions that they didn't expect, or mm -hmm. what have you, and. That's okay, but it's just a potential thing to be aware of. But at the same time, you should still also, it's okay to, as a client to be open with the astrologer. I mean, you don't want to be a jerk about it, but you can still be like, no, I'm sorry, that doesn't match my life at, at the present time, or, mm -hmm. or that doesn't quite jive. And, and sometimes that feedback is good and important because it can help the astrologer to um, look harder and sometimes modify what they're saying. Um, not in that they're like cold reading you, but there is a certain amount of like calibration that goes into understanding how the chart placements pl are playing out, and some factors could be offsetting, off offsetting certain placements mm -hmm. um, that they're not going to be taking into account, or they're not going to be realizing that that's offsetting things until they hear that that feedback from you. Mm -hmm, definitely, or it could have manifested in a different specific that still falls in the same arena symbolically in the in the astrology, and so, but you haven't mentioned that one yet, maybe. And so, if the client then says, "No, that hasn't been the case for me with that particular topic." You might be like, oh, okay, well, it can also be related to this topic, which maybe will fall in the same house or that kind of thing. And they might be like, oh, yeah, that actually does work. Yeah, like it can be like, um, let's just go back to our ninth house placements. Like the astrologer could say, this um, placement could manifest as a major focus on education. And you're like, no, education is not that important to me. And they're like, okay, well, in other areas that it could. Be a major focus on religion and spirituality, and you could be like, "Oh, yeah, I'm like training to be a priest or something like that." Mm -hmm. yeah. And then that process of you know hearing the initial delineation and giving that feedback of no, that's not connecting, 
that's probably actually one we should add on, which is a common mistake that clients make is not seeing the way that the archetype of what the astrologer is delineating can fit their life. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes they're expecting the astrologer to say, if not the precise exact thing, like to use the exact phrase. And unless the astrologer uses the exact phrase in the way that the client themselves conceptualizes it, mm -hmm. the client can sometimes reject that as being not relevant or not true. Even if it actually is, it's just not phrased in the precise way that the client understands it themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's say something about like religion or 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 spirituality or something like that. Like the astrologer could say, religion and spirituality is is a important topic for you. And the person's like, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. And but then the person is like, um, their professor of philosophy or something like that, let's say. Mm -hmm, right. And so in that way, that delineation is still true of like thinking about bigger picture things about existence or the philosophy or meaning of life or other things like that is somehow relevant in that person's life, but the mm -hmm. astrologer just isn't phrasing it in the exact way. And sometimes like a lot of clients, especially if they've been around astrology for a while, they understand the multivalence of the archetypes and can take in the delineation from the astrologer and say, no, that's not precisely too true, but that does relate to this part of my life. Mm -hmm. But there's some clients that don't realize that that's what they're supposed to be doing and that can create a stumbling block if they're not expecting or anticipating that. Yeah, definitely. I've had similar things where a few times actually I've had like career someone with um, their chart with career connected to the ninth house. But it won't be like a ninth house topic that they do for their career, but they actually like travel all the time for work. Mm -hmm. And so it can be like a totally different way that you're not necessarily expecting it to show up in the connection, but it still fits like one of the topics there. Right. And so like their career is not about travel, but they do travel for work. So it can be things like that as well, which, you know, it's um, astrology is a language and what we're doing is a translation and translation is imperfect especially when you're talking about multivalent things. And so, you know, it's a little bit of like a dialogue to try to get to those specifics um, that won't always hit on the very first try. Yeah, and figuring out that middle ground between when is it that the astrologer is um, really not saying something that's right or mm. not, not giving an accurate delineation of the chart for some reason versus when are they um, – getting close enough in the neighborhood that they're actually picking up on something that is a genuine portion of the person's life mm. but just needs to be maybe rephrased or reframed in a certain way in order to clarify the exact particular manifestation of the archetype. Right, right. And related to that in terms of feedback, um it is important like if the consultation is kind of if you're really not relating to something or if the consultation is not really going in the direction that you are hoping or it's not focusing on the things you were wanting to, it is important to like feel enough self-possession to to bring that up before the consultation is over. Um, yeah, you it's know, okay to like redirect things. Yeah. And the astrologer sometimes won't know if you need that and unless you say that, you know. So most of the time it seems like things are, you know, going fine. But if it's not going fine for you, you need to kind of be like, actually, I hoped we would talk about this. Um, and so there's still time left to do that. And mm. there's time left for the course correction rather than just being like disappointed after the fact. Because as we've been talking about, it is a dialogue. It is like a, a two-way interaction. It's not supposed to be like a performance that you are judging or a passive observer or things like that, unless it's like a pre-recorded, you know, like natal chart delineation. But most of the time with most consultations, it is a dialogue. And so you do need to play that part in going, oh, this isn't quite working for me or something like that. Right. Um, all right. So, and there's different angles or insights into a chart. You can go to different astrologers and they're going to read different placements differently. Um, some with more or less clarity, some just from different angles. Like there may be some astrologers that have more of a psychological take on things. There might be some astrologers that have more of a spiritual take on things. There might be some astrologers that have more of like a concrete predictive take on things. Um, that's one of the values of actually going to different astrologers, both purely as a client or as an astrology enthusiast, but also if you're a student of astrology or if you're even a professional astrologer or have aspirations to be a professional astrologer, 
um, one of the great things that you can do is go get your chart read by different astrologers because you'll see how different astrologers approach things. And sometimes that can be useful or illustrative, both in turning you on to different approaches to astrology that you might not know about anyways and you might want to study after getting a consultation. But also, if you become a professional astrologer at some point, it's important to have had that experience of getting your chart read with different astrologers so you can know, you know, what are some of the things that I I liked or didn't like about those consultations and that I would like to um, craft my own consultation style to be like in order to you know, give people the best consultations that I can, mm-hmm. having had that experience with other astrologers. What can I take from those experiences in order to do good consultations myself in the future? Right, right. And different astrologers, no matter what, like even if they have the same style, um, same approach to astrology, they're going to have different insights, you know, on different placements and maybe even have different insights like at different times on those placements. And that's why um, I always feel like it's really important that it's not just a single take on your chart. You don't just get your chart read once and then that's all there is to it and that's the only thing it can mean because there's different facets. There's so many different facets of like even just like a single placement or house rulership or something. And so different astrologers going to have different like insights you can take away from that that aren't necessarily like this one is true and therefore this one is false. It's just a different facets of the truth. Yeah. And the chart itself sometimes can be there's so much going on in it and there's so many different ways to look at it that sometimes there's some astrologers that um a consultation especially especially more psychological astrologers where a consultation is something you can do more than once that mm-hmm. you're not just not expected to necessarily but where you could talk about a certain number of things like let's say three or three to five topics in one consultation but then if there are other topics that you didn't get to that you still want to talk about and that the astrologer says that they could still address, you could just do another consultation at some other later date mm-hmm. in order to explore other parts of the chart. Yeah. And that's that's okay as well. Yeah, for sure. And especially if you're dealing with timing, because you know, when you start talking about timing and how different pieces of the chart are animated at different times, um, you know, you can talk about that pretty much um forever because the timing will always be changing. Yeah, and some astrologers or some clients will do like an annual consultation on their birthday mm. to look at um, their annual perfections or their solar turns or what their transits are going to be from the coming year or different things like that. And there's some clients as a practicing astrologer that you'll see periodic during periodically during the course of their life, and you'll you know do another follow up consultation a year or years later and you'll hear how things went and um how things ended up playing out and where they're at in their life now mm-hmm. and then that new context can help you to then project where things are going to go in the future mm-hmm. definitely yeah and that can be really valuable on both sides kind of seeing how those things change over time and how the specifics kind of come into manifestation in certain years and things like that right yeah for sure um, all right, so dialogue, preparations. You can ask individual astrologers if any preparation would be useful ahead of time for the consultation, such as, for example, sometimes looking back at past dates in your life or doing research into dates, especially if you're not that great at like recalling specific dates on the fly from memory. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it can be useful to research past dates when important things happened in your life so that if, for example, and to go into the consultation with that information because in some instances there's some astrologers that might that that information might be useful where they might want to know the date when you got married or you got your job or you got a job promotion or you got a divorce or you left the country and moved abroad or what have you mm. if knowing those dates could provide um, context by looking back at like the transits or what parts of your chart were activated at those times in order again to to get that sort of like trajectory of events in your life. Mhm, definitely. And different astrologers may want that more than others, um but especially if you're asking about a specific topic or two topics or something, um then you might look back at past dates related to those topics just in case it comes up. And similarly, I've had um a fair number of clients um come to the consultation with like a journal or a diary next to them or their email you know, up on the screen mm-hmm. so that they can quickly search for something um, if we're talking about dates. Right. Um, yeah. So that can be useful and can be 
again, just depending on different types of consultations can be useful if you're looking for something more predictive or more date oriented. And some astrologers may take that into account and others may not. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's good to good to think about or sometimes ask about if that would be helpful for the astrologer ahead of time or alternatively if that's not something they would normally take into account if it would not be. Right. Since you don't necessarily want to like force that issue if that's not their approach as well. For sure. Right. All right. We're back from a break. Uh where should we start again? Um, let's see. I think the next note was on expectations of specificity and what is and isn't possible. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's good to have reasonable expectations, which I know can be a little bit hard if you're coming in as a new person who doesn't know a lot about astrology yet um, or doesn't practice astrology yourself. But it's good to have reasonable expectations about what you can, um, what the astrologer can see in your chart. And that echoes a little bit back to what we were talking about in terms of providing context. So for instance, the chart will not tell the specific context of your life. It will tell some of the outlines of different areas of your life or some of the outlines of different pieces of your personality and so forth. Um, but it won't get all the way down to the specifics necessarily. Now, I want to sort of counter that. Like, you can sometimes see sort of surprisingly literal manifestations in the chart. Yeah, I mean, there's some surprisingly specific things. Mm -hmm, there are. It's just a matter of kind of like we were talking about it at length um, a few moments ago, you know, the multivalent nature of the symbols and um, different archetypes and so forth. So mm -hmm. they may or may not latch on to like the first one being the specific way that it plays out in your life or has so far. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's really tricky, but the main thing is just that there's the consultation between any astrologer when this is your first time seeing them is going to be an ongoing process of managing the expectations between the astrologer and the client and um, and getting and the client's expectations that they have going into it during the course of the consultation, getting um, appropriately adapted to what the astrologer actually has to offer, which mm. may be more specific or maybe less ex less specific than what the client is actually looking for, depending mm -hmm. on what their approach to astrology is. Right, definitely. And and also, I mean, that kind of harkens back a little bit too to when I was mentioning, you know, do you need a natal consultation or do you need a horary reading? Or because sometimes people are looking for like a really specific answer to like a yes or no question from a natal chart. Mm. And sometimes you can kind of see pretty well, but you can't always. Whereas like that is a little bit more of the nature of like a a horary chart is like just a chart for the question itself, whereas the natal has to encompass everything about your life. So may or may not drill down into the, like the very specifics of like one question you have. Yeah, or also like when should I start something, which might be more of an electional thing, mm -hmm. or is are me and this person compatible, which might be more of a relationship analysis analysis thing, mm -hmm. things like that. Right, definitely. Okay, so expectations. What are your expectations? Obviously, as a new person to astrology or new astrology, you might not know what to expect, but mm -hmm. figuring out how to modify that and adapt it to, you know, when I got into astrology, I expected it to be highly specific and, and entirely about like past life stuff mm -hmm. and predictive. And when I started learning astrology, I started learning it through like Astro Deanst, Astro.com, and through like modern psychological astrology, where it's not really predictive as much like prediction is more like a side effect or like epiphenomena of um psychological analysis and the ability of astrology to study people's psyche and so i had to then sort of change and adapt my expectations of what i thought i you should be able to do with astrology just coming in off the street to what astrology was actually like and how it was designed. And mm -hmm. then four or five years later, I had to go through another transformation when I discovered Hellenistic astrology, which was more predictive and concrete. And then again, started changing and adapting my expectations a little bit to what astrology could do in that context. Mm -hmm. And so I think every person who's seeing a new astrologer, adapting your expectations to match the what the astrologer actually has to offer is going to be a, a sort of ongoing process during the course of the consultation. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because even if you kind of know what astrology can do, 
different astrologers, you know, may offer different things. And, and so you do need to kind of on the fly, like adjust to what they are offering you in particular. Yeah. And it's better usually to adjust than it is to attempt to force the astrologer to meet whatever you, your expectation is of mm -hmm. what they should be able to do. Right. But instead, figure out what it is that this person does offer and what's interesting or useful about it, even if it's different than what you're expecting. Mm -hmm. That was a you know, for example, that was something that I commonly experienced when I was doing consultations when I would do like zodiac releasing. And zodiac releasing would always feature as a major component of pretty much all of my natal consultations. But it was such a different and a weird technique compared to what most astrologers were doing because it takes the entire life and breaks it up into different chapters and subsections as if the life is a book. And then we would spend time going through from the start of the person's life mapping out how well it had matched up to their life up to the present and then projecting that out in the future. Mm. Um, and that was very different than what most people were expecting, but they still, by the end of it, tended to leave pretty impressed and pretty interested in what I, I did actually have to offer. Mm -hmm. But it takes a little bit of being willing to let go of what your own expectations are to a certain extent in order to take in the unique Perspective that that astrologer that you're you could just sign up to get a consultation with has to offer you. Mm -hmm, definitely, yeah, I have that experience a bit too, where people are are thinking occasionally. I mean, I think it's it's helpful when people do hear you on podcasts or see blog posts or things like that. They know kind of what you do compared to another astrologer. Which is why it's good to research ahead of time if mm. you're the pers a client for a prospective astrologer, right? Like what their approach is, right? But I, so I usually, you know, clients do more or less know what to expect with me. But occasionally, I do get some people who are thinking I'm going to talk more about like their spiritual purpose or psychological tendencies. And you know, it's not that I can't speak to some of those pieces, but it's not where I usually focus. Um, but yeah, people usually are pretty happy with what it can do, what the tools that I use can do by the end. Um, I think some of my misconceptions when I first got into astrology about what it could provide in, within the context of a consultation, I was really bad about not giving context. Like in terms of giving feedback or giving like specifics about my own life, mm -hmm. um, I sort of thought when I started out that like I should be able to just sit back and listen more or less. Yeah, you're a ter terrible client. <laughs> I would be a terrible client. Yes. So like, I know. You were a terrible client. <laughs> so I know better. Well, I wasn't your client, just to no, be clear. <laughs> you're not my client. Yeah. Um, you're speaking more casually. But... You're just a friend that was very annoying to re re read your chart. <laughs> well, okay. So anyway. <laughs> I was mess messing with you yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I know that. So I know what some of those misconceptions early on feel like because I know I had some of them. So that was one of mine that you. Um, the astrologer should be able to just clearly say everything from the chart alone and not need my feedback or input or context um, is one thing. I know also I get, um, you know, sometimes people sort of have a really vague notion of what astrology can provide and that it's sort of allied to like spiritual topics. And so therefore, you should be able to tell them like, what is, what is my purpose in life? Like, what is my singular purpose in being alive? Things like that that are just really broad. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, you start to get a little bit more sense if you learn a little more astrology or you go to co a consultation or two, you start to get a sense of what, what is possible to do and what is sort of the best use of the time. Yeah. And, and I mean, there's some astrologers that do specialize in that, mm -hmm. so, which is fine if that's their thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I did some of this discussion is covering a little bit similar ground. And if people are interested in this discussion that we've had today, I'd recommend checking out um, episode 168 of the Astrology Podcast, which was titled Dennis Harness on Astrological Counseling Styles. And there's some pieces of this discussion that we expanded on there, and that's available both on the Astrology Podcast website page. If you go to the episodes page and scroll down to episode 168, as well as if you search our YouTube channel under that title, and, and there's some good additional discussions that's relevant both for clients as well as astrologers. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there anything else on that specific topic? Mm, I don't think so. I think we've kind of covered covered okay. it earlier. Okay. So um, follow up questions in emails afterwards, and um, the extent to which follow up questions are appropriate versus when it becomes almost inappropriate. 
Mm -hmm. So different astrologers can and do have different policies around this sometimes. And some of them will state them up front, or some of them will just have different ones if you ask. Um, so if you are wanting to ask a follow-up question later, I think you might, you know, it's good to ask at the end of the consultation if that's okay or not. Um, I usually find that it's most appropriate if it's like more of a clarification question rather than a new topic question, like that you didn't get to during the consultation. If you're clarifying something you didn't fully understand after going back and listening to the recording or something, it's also helpful, though, to do it like as soon as possible if you are going to have a follow-up question, because on the um, astrologer side, they may have had five other consultations even that week or something by the time that your question comes in, and then they're going to have to go back to your chart and refresh themselves and so forth. So um, I think it's always good to do it like as soon as possible, and if it's just like a clarifying thing, it can just be good to sit with what you have already talked about and just like absorb it a little bit. Yeah. You know, um, and then if you have questions after that, it might be appropriate to like do another follow up session later. Um, but that gets back a little bit to the like you can't cover everything in one session. Yeah, and we need to contrast that with what is the opposite extreme that would be inappropriate. Yeah, I mean, so sending lots of questions, you know, after the consultation, so, or so sending an email to the astrologer after the consultation with a list of like twenty questions, sure. it's like ten pages long. That would be inappropriate. That would be inappropriate. That would be clearly inappropriate. Thankfully, that doesn't normally happen um, to that extent. But you know, it's just important to know that even if you send not twenty questions, but like three questions or something, it's still like if it's not what you talked about during the consult, then that's not necessarily a great like email thing to do. Yeah, there's a little bit of an issue where in an astrological consultation, you're primarily paying for the astrologer's time mm -hmm. and what the set time limit is in which that is the arena in which you have a certain amount of time to ask the questions that are important and pertinent to you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't ask those questions and prioritize the most important ones within that and your time is up, then anything that you ask beyond that, you're kind of going over time and you're mm -hmm. kind of um, in a way it can sometimes, if you ask like 20 questions and the astrologer feels compelled, I mean, most won't, but if the astrologer felt like compelled to answer those, you're kind of um, pushing it and almost taking advantage of the astrologer to a certain extent if you're asking them to do extra work mm -hmm. outside of what you already paid them for, right. is why that becomes an issue and where it becomes a thing where on the, on the other side, uh, to, in terms of recommendations to astrologers, there's a certain point if a person's asking too many questions as follow up questions, the astrologer, it's within their right. And it's kind of okay to say, this really is something that would probably require us to do a second consultation in order for me to be able to answer all these questions. Mm -hmm. And it's tricky because there's a certain like middle ground there if, where if the person just has like one or two clarifying questions, that might be okay. And that might be. The astrologer might be fine with that. That's going to differ from astrologer to astrologer, mm -hmm. differ in terms of how busy they are, you know, many, mm -hmm. many other things. Right. But it's something to be cognizant of and, and careful about potentially um, because that is something that could be a mistake that you could make as a client or as a new astrologer if you expect or sort of like demand the astrologer to answer 20 other questions that you didn't bring up in the consultation. Because that would really be kind of pushing it into level of like inappropriateness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of that's a matter of boundaries, you know, and like having understood boundaries about this is the time that we're taking. Um, and you know, some of that can be like about a misunderstanding of what it takes to answer a question. Um, you know, even one question, which may take the astrologer going back to your chart after they've looked at a whole bunch of other ones and reminding themselves of like what it looks like and then maybe having to do like a timing technique depending on what you're asking. So it is like actually extra work. It's usually not just like off the top of your head response. Right. And so that's something good to know as well. Yeah, it takes like work and preparation for each question and that's why sometimes even needing to know that going into the consultations that they can do any necessary prep is is important. Mhm. Mm yeah, and just prioritizing what you want to talk about to make sure that you do get to talk about it. Right. So different astrologers have different policies. Um, obviously, sometimes when you're getting towards the end of your time, some people might panic and, and you know, you're know you running out of time, so you might try to cram some questions in, or there may be some things that were said earlier in the consultation that 
um, you've forgotten or you aren't really clear on. One thing that I always remind people of and that's really useful to remember if you're in a consultation is just remember that for most astrologers, once the consultation is over, you're going to get a recording of that consultation in some format, usually either audio or maybe video. Mm -hmm. Um, in which case, just remember that you're going to be able to go back and review the recording afterwards, mm -hmm. um, assuming that comes with the consultation. And most astrologers will say on their consultations page whether the what type of recording you'll get and whether you'll get a recording. Mm -hmm. And most will offer that. And remember, just remember that because it's something that's useful to know that you can go back and listen to things. And sometimes going back and re-listening to the conversation. Can give you um, some clarity uh, later on. Yeah, definitely, and especially if the astrologer is using tools or techniques that you're not as accustomed to, like then it's really extra helpful to listen through again and like fully absorb it, maybe yeah. more than you did the first time. Well, because you may go off and like study that technique and then get more proficient at it, and then you'll come back and listen to the consultation again and understand better why the astrologer was saying that or. Some of the additional nuances and details that maybe you missed at the time, but then once you have a better understanding of it or more clear to you, mm -hmm, for sure. So that that's helpful because it helps take some of the pressure off of you, and I think that's a really valuable thing about the consultation. Um, it's also one of the reasons why, as an astrologer, I would wake up with like cold sweats, the having a nightmare about like losing a consultation <laughs> recording. Yeah, uh, wherever astrologer mm -hmm. occasionally has that mm -hmm. one consultation where. Something happened and you lost the recording. Mm, yeah. So that does happen. It doesn't happen very often. I don't know why I'm mentioning that because it'll probably <laughs> scare some people. But yeah. most of the time, like 99% of the time, you're going to walk away with a recording. And that recording is kind of valuable because it does give you the ability to go back to that for years and sometimes gaining new insights from things. Um, Many years in the future. Mm -hmm. And if it's not clear, you can always ask in the beginning of the consultation is this being recorded for me? Or can I record this on my side? Mm. Um, and usually, the, you know, the small minority of astrologers who won't record it for you are fine with you recording it on your own. Yeah, right. Or if you don't want it recorded, I guess you could ask that. Yeah, I do ask that sometimes too, if people want to talk very confidentially. Right. Yeah. Um, so many people are using Zoom at this point that. Its built in audio and video recording capabilities are really handy mm -hmm. in terms of that being pretty reliable at this point. Yeah, definitely. I was thinking back as you were mentioning you know, losing recordings, and I think it's only happened to me twice, and it was back when I was using Skype years ago. But I don't think I've lost any since Zoom. Like you can forget to push record, but that's about it. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and I still have nightmares about losing the Dane Rudyer podcast episode with Chet Zdrowski, right. where we were prepared for months for that episode. It was like a two-hour recording. It was amazing. And then I looked at the file afterwards, and we only had like 20 minutes of audio, and we had to redo the entire thing a few days later. Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah. That uh, wasn't over Zoom? I don't know what that was over, but it was hmm. before or after that. That's when I instituted doing backup recordings for everything. So yeah. I haven't lost anything since then, and I've had to do fallback I've had to rely on the fallback recordings a few times when I like one of my primary or secondary ones have failed. Mm -hmm. But now I've got a pretty good system going. Yes, you have many backups. Yeah, I'm just jinxed myself as we're like going <laughs> right. into a Mercury retrograde. We're gonna like lose this recording. <laughs> I'm actually backing up a bunch of stuff right now from my desktop in preparation for this Mercury retrograde. Mm -hmm. So I hope I didn't jinx myself. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, so you'll get the recording. It's really useful. Uh, you can always refer to it, and hopefully that takes a little pressure off of you not to like have to remember and like fully internalize everything because mm -hmm. that's something you can sit with afterwards and may continue to be relevant for like years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love actually. Uh, it was just last week someone like played back the recording was like paraphrased or they like typed out what I said at like forty five minutes in, and it was like right after they just got. A new job that they didn't expect to get. And I was like, well, I think this looks really good for some sort of new job. And yeah, so it's cool that you can have that too when things happen that you're not expecting to happen. Right. Yeah. I myself don't have a recording of that other <laughs> consultation that I referred to years ago. I always wish that I did. Mm. Um, not just audio, but just video of your your bl <laughs> blank expression. And so I was reading your chart and you're just like, no, that's not. That's relevant true. to my life in any way, and you're a terrible astrologer. 
I did not say that for the record. I may not use those exact words, but I still hold a grudge. Mm, Yes. All right. Um, Follow-up questions by email. We got that. Remember, you'll have the recording. Um, Yeah. So this is helpful for astrologers as well on your side, not just the client side. Um, To think about how specifically you present yourself, like on your about page, on your um, consultation offerings, exactly what you write out, what you write out about your astrological style. Um, yeah, and just how you include that in different things, different pieces of the work that you do so that f- future prospective clients can understand where you're coming from already and know whether or not like you're a good fit for them. Yeah, and it's tough because there's a tension there that uh, consulting astrologers might have on their description page to not want to be overly specific because they don't want to like turn away clients who might see something and think, oh, like this astrologer doesn't do X, Y, and Z, and therefore I shouldn't consult with them mm. when there may be something valuable that that they could offer. And so there's sometimes a tendency that I think astrologers have to make things as broad or general as they can in order to not seem like they're excluding or turning anyone away. Mm-hmm. But I would argue that sometimes greater specificity in being clear about what your approach is and what you offer as a consulting astrologer can help you attract more of the type of clients that you want to see and that want to see you, that it's going to ensure that you're giving better consultations that the client is walking away happier with. Mm -hmm. And in the end, that's going to be a great greater sort of net benefit than it is a loss. Yeah, I agree. Like people are going to seek you out for the things that you actually have to offer rather than asking you to do things that are not your strengths and therefore, like neither of you being super happy at the end. Right, exactly. Yeah, Yeah, totally. So, what are some things about that? I mean, things like, you know, I like, I like seeing different astrologers' bio pages and seeing how they describe themselves. And somebody, sometimes people say, like it's been wild for me in the past few years to see people describing themselves as like a Hellenistic astrologer mm-hmm. or what have you, right. which is kind of a new thing. Um, but saying that, yeah, you have some fluency in like Hellenistic astrology, or you do evolutionary astrology, or you focus on psychological astrology, mm-hmm. um, saying that you specialize in secondary progressions or you know different timing techniques like transits or um, zodiac releasing. Mm-hmm. What else? Yeah. And the eclipses, um, some people do like solar arcs, things like that. Yeah, um, clarifying your offerings about what branches you offer and maybe mm-hmm. offering those for different prices in some instances, whether you offer you know, natal astrology or horary or electional or rectification mm-hmm. um, or other things like that. Some astrologers break things up into like those are very broad, somewhat broad categories by branches, but some astrologers break up their natal consultation offerings with like um, a natal chart reading versus like a solar re- solar return reading or mm-hmm. an annual prediction reading. Right. Or there's also some astrologers that do have a difference between like their first time client fee, mm-hmm. um, which is sometimes higher versus a follow-up consultations fee, which will be uh, lower than their initial fee. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So that's important to, to know going in too, in terms of like what the astrologer is going to be expecting to offer you. Um, I've never broken it up that way in terms of like, you know, just a standalone natal reading versus timing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I have in my description currently that I focus a little more on timing than static natal placements unless requested otherwise. Um, but it's certainly that's a common thing where people do break them up th- like that. Right. And so you have to just sign up for one or the other or both in order to get all of that. Yeah. And I don't, I never did that. I did break up the branches as mm-hmm. offerings, but not the different like consultation types within that. Mm-hmm. But it's something that's good to think about if that is something that you want to do, just in terms of making your offerings clear on your description page so that people know what they're getting. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Um, anything else about that in terms of uh, consulting astrologers? Mm, no, I think that's all. Okay. Anything about clients that it's just a good idea to see different astrologers, get exposed to different approaches? Mm-hmm. Kind of covered that. Yeah, we kind of covered that. All right. Um, I guess all I got, and I already said part of this earlier, is something about I've been thinking about a lot about the 
hermetic nature of astrology and astrology traditionally being ruled by the planet Mercury. Um, it's partially because astrologers were viewed as messengers or translators of the stars and of fate. Mm -hmm. um, astrological consultations have always, in its thousand year history, primarily been done verbally. This is actually, from a historical standpoint, a really annoying part of studying the history of astrology is, especially in very early astrology in like the Babylonian and Mesopotamian period and even into the Hellenistic period, we have a bunch of like sometimes cuneiform tablets, like little clay tablets, or sometimes pieces of papyrus that contain birth chart placements, but we don't actually have the interpretations that go with those placements, so we don't necessarily always know how the astrologers would have interpreted a birth chart because that information probably would have been conveyed verbally uh, just like it is still in modern times where the vast mm -hmm. majority of astrological consultations are not written out or even pre-recorded ahead of time. They are um, done through a verbal consultation that takes the form of a dialogue between the astrologer and the client. Mm -hmm. So um, there's something about the nature of the exchange between the client and the astrologer that draws something else out and that you create during the course of the consultation through the negotiation of understanding the person's life or birth chart or fate or what have you, whatever you want to call it, that is an important and unique experience that comes about as a part of um, an exchange and like a first house self and seventh house other type exchange between the two parties. And it's very much it's it's like a process instead of just something that goes all one way or the other. Mm -hmm, right. And it's kind of like negotiating the symbols themselves mm -hmm. and kind of like teasing out the specifics in that dialogue. Um, and almost it's not quite to the extent of this, but it's almost like creating a third entity of the conversation itself. Yeah. And, and sometimes that is in you can you can kind of see that and how well it's going to go in the consultation chart itself. Mm -hmm. And yeah. sometimes you can see if you cast like a chart for the start of the consultation to some extent, like what the focus of the consultation is going to be, or um, just some of the things that are going to come up and what the dynamic is between the astrologer and the client. Mm -hmm. um, this became kind of annoying for me back when I was doing consultations because then I would try to pick better electional charts sometimes yeah. because I would sometimes have a, a chart where I just like scheduled it whenever and it would end up being like a bad electional chart and then mm -hmm. it wouldn't like go very well. Right. And so then it sometimes made me more paranoid about wanting to pick out like better charts for each consultation. But then that mm -hmm. becomes, if not a hassle, somewhat impractical right. if you're doing a certain amount of consultations each month. Yeah, definitely. And I still sort of do that, but uh, also agree that it's a hassle. Yeah, so yeah. that's <laughs> tricky. And also to a certain extent, you can't really control like the transits that the astrologer or the client are having on that day, which mm -hmm. may be more positive or negative. Right. So something I say a lot, um, especially when people are like graduating my courses, like my Hellenistic astrology course or my electional course, and they're asking where to go. Um, one of the pieces of advice that I often give is that astrology, learning astrology is about 50% book learning, where you're learning from reading books or taking classes or listening to lectures or workshops or what have you. But the other 50% of learning astrology only happens when you sit down with clients on a regular basis and you talk to them about their lives because that's when through talking about their lives you start seeing how the principles not just apply in practice but you start seeing unique manifestations of certain placements that you would never have seen otherwise mm -hmm. and that really sticks with you as a consulting astrologer um, and becomes part of your like uh, memory bank as an astrologer to draw on in the future for understanding the symbolism of those placements and how it can play out in practice. Mm -hmm. But you can get some of that from reading a book, but you cannot get all of it. There's a huge part mm -hmm. of that experience that is very, um, I always use the term visceral way too frequently. Is there like a synonym that I could come up with? Embodied. Embodied, I guess. That sounds a little little something else but process oriented i, I could know. just start yeah. listing some just blank it's a little there's a blank there that you only get from sitting with a client and hearing about their life firsthand and being able to ask them questions and them give you feedback and then you further refine and like dial in the interpretation of that placement once you start understanding it more mm -hmm. 
that the that astrology really comes alive at that point and it stops being this abstract thing that's like you know just this two dimensional circle with a bunch of weird lines and weird symbols on a piece of paper it becomes something that is living and yeah embodied because you see the person who's living their chart embodying it and having successes and failures and like fortune and misfortune and highs and lows and all sorts of different things in a perfect manifestation of their chart in some unique way um, because each birth chart is unique and because each individual's life is unique. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why I always say it's a good idea once you've learned the basic principles of astrology and you've like taken a course or, or two or, or something to start giving consultations sooner rather than later, even if you're only charging very little for them at first, because you're going to start racking up experience. And that experience becomes part of your learning as an astrologer because an astrological consultation, you know, I always say one of the great secrets about astrology is an astrological consultation is not just a learning experience for the client, it's also a learning experience for the astrologer. And the astrologer gains and grows from it as an astrologer, kind of like if it was like a video game and you're building up like experience points. Like mm -hmm. every client you see, you get like a new experience point and it adds to your like overall score. And eventually you like level up as an astrologer once you do 10 clients or 50 clients or 100 clients. And it's a little tricky. And that was hard for me to accept at first as a 20 something astrologer that it does place. Younger astrologers sometimes at a disadvantage because you haven't been able to see as many clients yet. Mm -hmm. And it is something that you do get better at the more and more experience you have. That doesn't mean that there aren't younger astrologers that cannot have, can be great at astrology or can excel at understanding it better than somebody maybe that's been studying it for 30 or 40 years by having a, a better aptitude for it or something like that. But it is the case that the more experience you get, even that young astrologer that has a lot of aptitude in it, they're going to be way better at it 10 years from now than they were when they first started. Mm -hmm. So sometimes starting to get that experience is a really good idea and can be very valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we discussed that in one of the episodes about like, should you become an astrologer before your Saturn return? And that was one of the points is, you know, that you have to get into practice in order to get better, like after a certain point. Um, and you You'll just kind of stay almost at the same stage if you don't do that because there's so much you won't read from books. And it's not just meeting different people and seeing how that works out in real life, but also there's so few symbols, you know, in a chart, even if you're using a bunch of symbols, right? There's so few compared to like representing the entirety of life and life possibilities. And so, you know, even in, in book learning, you're not even going to see all of the manifestations listed. Like I know I mentioned recently on Twitter, like one of my current favorite 12th house manifestations is archives. Like I've talked with several people at this point who've worked in library archives or some sort of like specialized archives. And you don't read that in a book that 12th house is arch archives, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, so it's talking with like lots of like people from lots of different walks of life to see how this can play out in so many ways. Yeah, or like there was a student of the Hellenistic course recently that was sharing an example of somebody where um, the chart was of like a, a woman that had um, Venus as the ruler of the fifth house of children in the seventh house of relationships and the marriage partner. And Venus was like square Saturn in a day chart with reception. Mm -hmm. So, what is that? That's like six or seven different unique pieces of criteria, but the specific manifestation was. That at this point in this person's life, they were um, struggling to have children, even though they wanted to, because their partner was um, what's the have fertility problems? Yeah, but is, do you use the same term when it's the the yeah. man, man that has like the fertility issues? I think so. Okay, is infertile? Yeah, uh, I thought there was like another word, but anyways, but that was the specific or unique manifestation of that placement that perfectly fits the symbolism of ruler of fifth house of children and seventh house of relationships, square Saturn in a day chart with reception. Mm -hmm. And in that, you can also see the potential that because it's a day chart and it's with reception so that there's two mitigating factors, right. um, there's the potential for that to be a surmountable difficulty that the person might overcome through great striving, mm -hmm. like for example, like getting fertility treatments or something. Mm -hmm. 
um, or some other our mitig- adoption, yeah, or yeah. some other mitigation where they're able to overcome that. Versus if it was like if there were no mitigations and it was worst case scenario, and so it becomes something where it just completely blocks that as an option, and the person is never able to do that thing at any point, would be a different specific manifestation. Mm-hmm. But you can see how that unique manifestation that you may not have thought of before as being a specific manifestation perfectly fits the symbolism mm. and then becomes added to your sort of repertoire of if you see that again you know this is how that could play out archetypally and right. sometimes asking the client and saying the last time i saw this placement it worked out in this way and then asking how has that worked out for you mm-hmm. and sometimes by doing that that will spark something in the client where they will connect um, maybe it may not be that meth- that specific manifestation. I mean, it could be in some instances, mm-hmm. but maybe it could be something very similar to that, and then the client will let you know, and then you'll continue dialoguing about it. Definitely. Yeah. So 50% book learning, 50% from doing consultations. Um, astrology, always a learning experience, and always a first house and seventh house exchange between the two parties. So uh, do what you can as the client to make the most of it because it's your time and you're focusing on your life. And certainly you want to do your best to get the most out of it um, if you're going to take the time to do it at all. So just try mm-hmm. to be um, thoughtful about it and go into it having considered some of those different things that we've talked about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just think about what you need, what you're looking for at this time, even if it's not what you need forever. Um, research different astrologers, different approaches, and see if that fits most what you need right now. And then prioritize your questions so that you get covered what you're looking for during the time available. Yeah. Um, and one of the things we didn't talk about is just like where to find an astrologer. And I mm. think that's that can be really tricky, but just doing searches online, doing searches for what you're looking for, mm. joining different um, social networks like Twitter, seeing who's talking about astrology on Twitter or mm. see who's talking about astrology on Facebook, if, yeah. in Facebook like astrology groups or other astrology forums. Who's speaking at conferences um, and what they specialize in and what they're talking about. Also yeah. asking friends or acquaintances within the astrology world, like who have you really liked readings with? Yeah, references, mm-hmm. um, you know, astrologers that have written books mm-hmm. um, or you mentioned conferences or other workshops. Um, or have given online webinars for different groups. Mm-hmm. Or have um, written articles like in magazines, like the Mountain Astrologer or other magazines. Yeah, there's actually a professional directory in the Mountain Astrologer magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, I do like the audio or video a little bit better because it gives you a little better sense of like their manner of talking, you know? Yeah, like if you like a YouTube channel or something mm-hmm. like that or a podcast. Yeah. I mean, it's a little tricky because sometimes if. The rankings of things like YouTube and search results can sometimes be manipulated, or mm-hmm. the thing that the person sometimes is the most popular for some reason is not necessarily because they're the best yeah. astrologer. So that's one of the reasons why you want to research things, and sometimes getting referrals can be helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, and different things like that. There's sometimes different directories, like find an astrologer or find astrologer. There's like two sites that have almost the same name that are titled that that give different directories for astrologers. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of different options. On my consulting site at chrisbrennanastrologer.com, I send out sort of referrals to different, I have links up to some different astrologers that I send people to for consultations. And I've been refreshing that recently because I've been basically directing all my consultations to you and Patrick Watson for the past few years. But now you guys are largely booked up. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm adding some other people to those lists recently, like students and friends who have similar approaches. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different places you just need to do your research ahead of time. That way, you can make a sort of wise investment in um, getting a consultation. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's it for this episode. So, thanks for mm-hmm. helping me to put together this discussion. Thanks to uh, Carly, Kaylee Ray on Instagram, again, at underscore at underscore KR underscore craft for that topic. It was a really good topic. Mm-hmm. Um, if people have any other good topics you want to hear on the astrology podcast in the future, feel free to let me know. I always like suggestions. I don't particularly like if people like try to hassle me or pressure me into doing certain topics or interview certain people, but feel free to give um, suggestions because I'm always open to that. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, uh, that's it. Well, thanks everyone for listening to this episode of the Astrology Podcast, and we will see you again next time. See you next time. 
Special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the Astrology Podcast through our page on Patreon.com. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Nate Craddock, Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Nadia Habhab, Issa Sabah, Morgan McKinsey, and Jake Otero. For more information about how to become a patron and get access to exclusive subscriber benefits such as early access to new episodes, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. Also, special thanks to our sponsors, including the Northwest Astrological Conference, which is happening online May 27th through the 31st, 2021. Find out more information at norwak.net. The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which you can find out more information about at mountainastrologer.com. The Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, which you can find out more information about at honeycomb.co. Also, the Portland School of Astrology, more information at portlandastrology.org. The Astral Gold Astrology app, available for both iPhone and Android, available at astrogold.io. And finally, the primary software program that we use on episodes of the Astrology Podcast is called Solar Fire Astrology Software, which is available at alabe.com, and you can get a 15% discount with the promo code AP15. Thank you.